Okay, thank you for bearing with us. Uh, up next, we have Alana Hashman with the ma magic of Python wheels. Uh, it's just a time. Here it goes. Hello, PyCon. Can you hear me? Great. Okay, sorry for the initial technical difficulties. I'm Alana Hashman. Uh, welcome to my talk, The Black Magic of Python Wheels. If you want to tweet, my handle is at ehashdn. So today, I'm gonna to put on my Python Packaging Authority hat. Yes! <laughs> and tell you a little about Linux wheels, uh, or Python wheels, particularly for the Linux platform. Now, you may be thinking, Alana, I'm not a witch. I'm not so sure about this black magic thing. To which I'll say, sometimes the greater good requires a bit of sacrifice. <laughs> I will admit, I had a lot of doubts myself when I was doing the research for this talk. There used to be so many problems with Python eggs. Obtaining reagents for your Python potions is rough. Now, if you are a witch, then I'm delighted to welcome you here at the Hour of Gathering. The topic today is the Python native extension and its distribution, a most curious spell. Before we jump into things, let's do a quick survey of the coven. How many of you are familiar with Python packaging and distribution? Great. How many of you have heard of ELF or executable and linkable format files? Wow, great. How many of you have heard of dynamic linking? Still a lot of people. Uh, stretch goal. How many of you have heard of application binary interfaces or symbol versioning? Ah, less hands. Great, well, you're in the right place. And don't worry too much if some of these concepts aren't familiar to you. By the end of this talk, I am hoping you'll come away with a better understanding of modern Python packaging and learn how each of these concepts work together under the hood, unlocking some of the witchcraft behind how computers work really. So, what are we going to cover? First, a very brief history of Python packaging formats and an overview of the wheel. Next, the motivation behind native extensions and why binary wheels are useful. We'll spend the bulk of the talk discussing how do native extensions even work, really, including a discussion of how Python packaging tools, mini Linux, and audit wheel fit into this picture. And last, I'll close with how you might get involved in some of this wheel building yourself if you're interested. As I mentioned earlier, before the Python wheel, there was the egg. Now, eggs served the community as best they could, but they had some problems. They were organically adopted without the guidance of a PEP, and hence there were many conflicting ways to do the same things. Without a standard, there was nothing to coordinate the thousands of Python developers trying to ship software to end users, and incompatibility was inevitable. Eggs were also designed to be directly importable, and as such, they could contain some or even exclusively compiled PyC files, which might not actually be compatible with the version of Python you have installed. So wheels were designed by the Python community via a PEP to provide that standard and implement many of the existing PEPs that eggs did not comply with. Among other things, wheels provide much better metadata than eggs and are designed to be more portable as they are primarily a means of distributing, not importing Python. Wheels cannot contain PyC files, although they can contain other pre-compiled resources. Now, there are three kinds of wheels worth mentioning. First, pure wheels. These wheels consist of just Python code. They may target a specific version of Python, such as Python 3.7. Next, universal wheels, uh, which are a special kind of pure wheel. They are Python 2.3 compatible. For these first two kinds of wheels, I've got great news. They're not much different than bdist eggs. You just have to run the following two commands, and boom, you get a wheel. Now, unfortunately, not all Python packages fall into one of these two categories or else the talk would be over and I could spare you from the dark knowledge of this other kind of wheel. This last kind is called an extension wheel, which contains a Python extension. How many of you have heard of a Python extension? Yeah, well, rather than trying to explain to you what a Python extension is, I think the best way to introduce them is to tell you about this rite of passage many early Python programmers go through, myself included, and through this example, we'll see how wheels make it easier to roll out Python. We're going to pretend that I'm a newbie Python developer, and I'm trying to get my Python environment set up to work on this cool web app. So here I am installing pip install requirements.txt, and one of my requirements is cryptography because I know security is important and I want to use SSL. So here I go. 
I'm going to install cryptography and get to work. And oh, the installation fails because I'm missing python.h? What's python.h? Why do I have a pound include in my error here? I have no idea. Remember, I'm a new Python programmer. But I do a little hunting on Stack Overflow and learn I need to install the Python dev package. So, okay, let's do that. Problem solved, right? Well, actually it turns out I'm missing ffi.h as well, whatever that is. So I do another search on my favorite search engine, find that I need to install libffi.dev and I should be good to go, right? Who thinks this is gonna work? <laughs> uh. Well, the nays have it. Now I'm missing OpenSSL. I still don't know what the heck is going on, but I figure, eh, every time I install a thing, I've got a little further, why not install another thing? How many more things could there possibly be? <laughs> Do you think this is gonna work now? Yay, well, it finally worked this time. And it took 16 seconds overall to install, not including all of my frantic stack overflow searches. So. That's kind of slow, like an extra 16 seconds on every fresh build. That's maybe a lot of time I could be shaving off of my CI runs. Who thinks we can do better? Oh, some people, good, enthusiasm. What if I told you that the solution is a pre-built extension wheel? Well, let's try it out. Here, I'm gonna install pre-built wheel, avoiding all of those system package installations. And on top of that, I shaved 15 seconds off of install time. What sort of black magic is this? What's the catch? What's going on here? This accomplishment is a really big deal for the Python ecosystem. Historically, it was very painful and user unfriendly to pip install Python extensions, as demonstrated by our earlier example. Now, the Conda package format was developed to address this gap, particularly for the Py scientific Python ecosystem, and it's done a great job of that. Conda's very popular, so why bother with, shall we say, uh, reinventing the wheel here? Uh, well, Conda, like eggs, was not adopted by a PEP and suffers from similar incompatibility issues. As well, the Conda package format can be used to package anything, not just Python code, and hence isn't supported by the Python Packaging Authority or PyPI. And Conda packages are only compatible with Conda environments, meaning that if you wanna use just one Conda Python package, the rest of your Python packages must be Conda too. You can't mix and match. Hence the need for the Python Packaging Authority to address this gap. Conda's a great solution and works for a lot of people, but it doesn't work with PIP and PyPI. While Conda packages don't work with non-Conda environments, you can install wheels in a Conda environment, which is great news for Conda users. So Python extension wheels allow end users to, for example, safely install, uh, pip install NumPy, whereas a few years ago, that would have been very inadvisable. So I'd say binary wheels are an amazing change for the better. So what is a Python extension? Well, it's short for Python native extension. And native means that this code was built specifically for my operating system and my version of Python. My OS is its home. If I try to run this cryptography wheel that I downloaded from my Linux machine on my Windows laptop, that won't work. If I try to run this wheel against Python 3.4 and it was built for 3.5, that won't work either. So if I want to distribute pre-compiled versions of my Python native extension, I have to build a version that covers every single operating system, Python version, and CPU type combination. The extension bit refers to the fact that we're extending Python's functionality with some code that wasn't actually written in Python. You may have guessed by now that our example package cryptography is a Python native extension. If we look inside cryptography's code, indeed we see that a small component of it is written in C, and many of the files have pound include statements de declaring C dependencies. The setup.py file inside cryptography indicates that it provides a CFFI extension package. CFFI is a library used for declaring and interacting with C foreign function interfaces. So, what does all this mean? It turns out a lot of Python code depends on code that is not Python at all. C is the lingua franca of the modern operating system, for better or for worse. While not all Python extensions depend on C libraries, for example, many of the scientific Python libraries depend on G Fortran, under the hood, more or less everything has a dependency on the C runtime, including G-Fortran, I checked. With C compatibility, we can harness the power of thousands of existing libraries without having to re-implement them in Python, which may be very time-consuming or even impossible. 
Python native extensions allow us to harness this power. But now we're not just in the business of managing Python, we're in the business of managing C code as well, and that's where things start to get messy. In order to understand how extension wheels work, we must first understand how C works. C is a compiled language. That is, the code I write must be fed to a program called a compiler, and the compiler turns that into a bunch of machine code that can be run directly by my CPU. On this slide, I have an example Hello World program written in C. It calls puts, which stands for put string, from the standard I.O. library in order to print Hello World. In order to run the code, I first need to compile it. So I invoke the GNU, CCC, or the GNU C compiler GCC, and by default, it produces an executable called a.out, since I didn't specify an output name. The output on the right here is a byte-by-byte -byte printout of my compiled application in hexadecimal form. This executable consists of a bunch of native machine code, zeros and ones, that can be run directly on my specific CPU. If you work with a lot of ASCII, those first four bytes might look a little familiar. The format of this compiled program is called an ELF file, which stands for executable and linkable format. And indeed, the second through fourth bytes literally spell out ELF, E-L-F. So, now that we've got hexes and elves on our hands, I suppose we've passed the point of no return, so we may as well take a closer look inside. Executable refers to the fact that this binary contains machine code that we can execute, but what does linkable mean? I'm gonna use a tool called readelf to try to make sense of this binary file. The dash A flag means to print all sections of the file. On the next few slides, I'm gonna explain some pieces of the produced output. The first chunk of output displayed here on this slide is part of the header of the ELF file. The ELF format is standardized, and the first thing I want to point out to you is I have not been exaggerating. The first piece of metadata in the header is literally called magic. <laughs> and if you can remember from the last slide, these magic first 32 bytes are the same as what was displayed there. I also want to point out this file is aware of the machine architecture it was compiled for. In this case, AMD x86-64. Different machine architectures require different compiled code since they have different CPU with instruction sets. For example, I can't run 64-bit code on a 32-bit machine because the instructions won't fit. <coughs> Next, we'll take a brief walk through the program headers. In particular, I want to point out the program interpreter whose location was hard-coded into this binary at, at compile time. The program interpreter, also called an ELF interpreter, is the program needed to make this binary run on my operating system. The ELF interpreter is responsible for making sense out of this pile of binary, which is a very good thing because if I had to do it, I imagine I'd go mad. Next, we'll take a look at the relocation section. This is where we record any symbols that our code relies on but don't have a corresponding implementation in our binary. In our case, we called puts from the standard library rather than defining its implementation in our program, so that implementation needs to be filled in later. There is only one entry in this table, puts at glibc 2.2.5. Now, I remember we called puts, but what's this at glibc bit all about? This is what we call a symbol version. In the same way that we can version APIs and import or call a specific version of a dependency in our code, an application binary interface, or ABI, can also have versions. The compiler tacking this version onto our put symbol ensures that when we go to find the implementation of puts, we don't accidentally call the wrong version, which might have an incompatible interface with what our program was compiled against. And unlike with semantic versioned APIs, where typically only one version of the library is installed or loaded at a given time, application binary interfaces usually contain many version implementations in order to ensure backwards compatibility. Last, let's take a look at the version needs section of our ELF file. Uh, version R here stands for version required, and this section tells us what versions are needed for each library file we depend on. So here we see we depend only on one file, libc.so.6 with version name glibc2.2.5. And this makes sense. This is the version of the put symbol we saw on our last slide, and we know we called puts from the C standard library, aka libc. So let's illustrate how this all works together. In my C code, the file hello.c, I depend on puts from standard IO, a part of the C standard library. When my code is compiled into the binary file a.out, the C compiler resolves the put symbol to puts with version glibc2.2.5. 
the version required table in this binary then tells us we can get this symbol with that version from libc.so.6. If we look inside libc.so.6, and I'm sparing you from having to read any read elf output, we see that it has a section called GNU version D or version definitions, and glibc 2.2.5 is one of those declared versions as well as a bunch of more recent versions. If we take a look at the din sim or the simple table for dynamic linking, we find the implementation of our function puts with the correct version. So now that we have all these pieces, how do they work together when we try to run this program? Well, when we run the file a.out before the code can actually execute on our CPU, we first have to brave a bunch of eldritch horrors under the hood. What happens looks something like this. First, our OS parses the magic elf bytes at the beginning of the binary. This is our arcane invocation. Next, the OS invokes the elf interpreter specified by the binary. Only the elf interpreter can unlock the powers within. The elf interpreter is also a native program, so if this elf file wasn't compiled for my CPU, I won't be able to run it as the right program interpreter won't be found. Assuming the correct elf interpreter is there, it will load any required files with valid versions as specified by the binary, and it will move things around and lay everything out all nicely in memory to ensure this code can actually run. Only then can our CPU execute the binary instructions loaded in memory and breathe life into this program, printing the ancient letters upon our screen. Hello world. This rather frightening process is usually referred to as dynamic linking, and it's how almost every program on your Linux system works, including Python programs. Okay, so now we understand how these C programs express and load their binary dependencies, how do our Python programs do it? Well, the good news is the Python interpreter handles most of the heavy lifting for us in that respect, dealing with all the dynamic linking and the like. Our responsibility as the user of this software is to ensure that any C dependencies our Python program has are available on our system for the program to use and that our Python extension is compiled to be able to link against them. So there are two ways to do this. The old way, which is still completely valid, is to provide a source-only download of the Python extension and ask our users to compile our Python extension from source. We give users the Python package code and then finding all the foreign dependencies is their problem. When the Python extension gets installed, it will build against the system-installed version of dependencies, which will ensure that the output binary depends on the right system library application binary interfaces. So what we saw earlier with cryptography the hard way. But we also saw there is a shiny new way we can do this. With an extension wheel pre-built by a package developer, we can remove the compilation burden from users. By bundling pre-compiled binary dependencies into our Python wheel, everything the end user needs will be available without them having to install or compile anything outside of their desired package, assuming wheels are available for all of its dependencies. And as we saw earlier trying to install cryptography, the old ways have many problems. It's slow because we need to compile everything from source and that's computationally intensive. This also means the end user needs to install not just runtime dependencies, but also any build time dependencies needed by our extensions, which is a ton of extra work for end users that just wanna use my library. It's also possible that the user runs into version mismatches where they've installed a version of a dependency that's different than the developer intended because that's what was available in their OS package manager resulting in subtle bugs or unintended behavior that they might not have the expertise to diagnose. And last, as we saw earlier, this will frequently require knowledge of the system package manager or at least stack overflow, which is a really bad experience for new users that just want to try out Python stuff. Now we still need the old way because someone is always going to have to compile things from source in order to produce a compiled binary but isn't it better to just leave this in the hands of experts rather than requiring every end user to become an expert on compiling C and Fortran? So, binary Python wheels solve this problem. They ensure that the dependencies provided inside the wheel are always the right versions, and they come pre-compiled so users don't have to worry about any uh, compilation steps. This also means installations are much faster. And since wheels are Python native, you just pip install them. No knowledge of outside package management required. But how can we ensure the pre-compiled binaries are compatible with my system? 
The cryptography developers might be, might be running the latest Ubuntu 18.10, and I'm stuck in the Stone Age because I'm running 14.04 because I hate upgrading my laptop. Uh, this is a really hard problem. How would we know if our pre-compiled binaries would be compatible with whatever random version of libc an arbitrary user had installed? Well, from the example earlier in the talk, you may remember that we had a simple C program that depended on the put symbol, and once it was compiled, it had a simple version attached. Recall too that while C libraries add new impl version implementations, they also keep the older versions to support backwards compatibility. So what if we just depended on a really old version of libc when we built our dependencies for distribution? Wouldn't that maximize compatibility for everyone? This cuts to the question at the heart of this talk. How can we ship compiled Python extensions that are compatible with as many systems as possible? Now we have all the magic we need to answer that question. The answer, symbol versioning and dependency bundling achieved with the Python packaging tools, many Linux and audit wheel. So what are these things? In order to ensure widespread compatibility of compiled binaries, PEPs 5.13 and 5.71 define a minimal set of permitted libraries and symbol versions that can assume to be present on the average Linux system for built wheels. Any other symbols that a wheel depends on must be declared inside that wheel. This ensures that Python wheels don't use any cool new GCC features that aren't available on older systems or assume that certain shared objects will be available. You may remember that in my cryptography installation example, the first thing I had to install was the Python dev header package. For this reason, even the Python development libraries are not included in this minimal base. Thus, we ensure that many Linux systems are compatible with this standard. Hence the name Many Linux. Many Linux is both the name of the policy and a Docker image used to implement these policies. The original policy from PEP 513 and corresponding Docker image was called Many Linux 1, based on the CentOS 5 distribution. And the newest many Linux policy and Docker image called many Linux 2010 is based on CentOS 6, which was released in 2010. Both images are available for the AMD64 and i386 architectures. By building your extension wheels inside this Docker container, you can ensure that you use a build environment that's compatible with the aforementioned PEPs, making it easier to produce a compliant binary. Once you've produced a wheel through some means, many Linux or not, you can inspect it with audit wheel. Audit wheel investigates any symbols and versions contained inside your built wheel and determines if the wheel is policy compliant. Given the set of many Linux policies and a priority ordering, audit wheel finds all external symbols and their versions that your wheel depends on and labels it with the strictest policy your wheel complies with, if any. But that's not all audit wheel can do. Audit wheel can do much more than just checking compliance against the many Linux policies. Since it already has a very dark understanding of the inner workings of wheels in order to determine whether or not they comply with policies. As such, Audit Wheel can use that arcane knowledge to actually locate external versions of dependencies on your systems, make copies of them, perform name mangling, and then update paths to bundle these dependencies directly into your built wheel for distribution. This is extremely spooky. This empowers Python developers to build many Linux wheels without having to make substantial changes to their build processes. All they need to do is build and install dependencies inside the appropriate many Linux image and then build their wheel like they normally would. Running audit wheel repair on a built wheel will bundle all the necessary binary dependencies inside and produce a policy compliant wheel installable on many Linux systems. To illustrate and summarize this process from start to finish, I will share this picture. As developers, we start with our excellent Python extension. First, we build it inside the many Linux image uh, against each version of Python we support and for each architecture we support. Once our wheels are built, we then repair them with audit wheel, which will bundle copies of any native dependencies required by the package. We then use audit wheel to inspect that output, ensuring that all the included symbol versions comply with the desired policy. And last, we upload our wheels to PyPI, giving users the option of downloading and installing binary extension wheels, speeding up their installs and reducing their dependency overhead. So now that you understand a little more about how this works and what you need to do to build a wheel, how can you get involved? We would love to see you build wheels of your package if you're not doing that already. 
Feedback is enthusiastically welcomed. Please let us know if it doesn't work. File bugs, we want to make it better. Pythonwheels.com has some information about wheels as well, including which of the top 360 ha -ha, packages on PyPI ship wheels. I didn't cover how to make a Python extension because that's out of the scope of this talk, but this is a great place to see how and why different projects are doing that. You could also use this to find an example package and see how they build wheels for inspiration. We didn't cover Windows or Mac OS wheel building in this talk, so that could be a good resource if you want to target those systems too. We also have a mini Linux demo repo with a more straightforward example to play around with if you just want to try out a more hello world sort of wheel build. There's another way you can get involved. Audit Wheel needs a new maintainer because after three years, I am stepping down. Uh, there's also a lot of work to be done on the new Mini Linux 2014 spec and existing Mini Linux Docker images which don't currently have a maintainer. If you're at all interested, do come find me and I'll try to put you in touch with the right folks in PyPA to help you help us. Do we have time for questions? No, we do not. So, thank you. <laughs> Thanks to my employer for letting me attend. Thanks to these folks for reviewing my talk. Uh, if you want to check out some resources I posted related to my talk, you can visit this link on my website. It includes a copy of these slides, links to all the reference peps, supplemental readings, and more. Thank you so much for attending. Woo!